Okay, so in today's class I will be discussing uh, something called the energy momentum tensor or the stress energy tensor of the electromagnetic field. So if you recall in the last class I had pointed out that there is a, a two component object which is uh, called a tensor which is a conserved quantity. So that means it is made of the components, it is an anti-symmetric tensor that means the diagonal elements are all 0. The off diagonal elements are the components of the L, three components of the electric and three components of the magnetic fields. Uh, so the point is that uh, this is uh, a conserved quantity in the sense that its four vector divergence uh, is 0 for, uh, with respect to any one of the indices. So the bottom line is that uh, what I want to do now is I want to convince you that there is a conserved quantity. Uh, in consistent, uh, consistent with Noether's theorem, there is a conserved quantity uh, which is also a two component tensor that means it is basically a tensor of rank 2. So the question is how do you show that? So uh, to show that uh, we start with this Lagrangian of the sourceless electromagnetic field that means imagine that there is a there is an electromagnetic field where there are no sources or that is that is possible and basically the Lagrangian is given by the integral of the Lagrangian density and the Lagrangian density is just uh, the uh, square of the electric minus square of the magnetic field. So that means the difference of the squares of the electric and magnetic field. So keep in mind I am working in CGS units so E and B have same dimensions. Now. Uh, Bottom line is that you can also express uh, this Lagrangian in terms of uh, the field tensor. So this is what I had displayed earlier the, the 4 by 4 matrix and the anti-symmetric 4 by 4 matrix. Now in terms of the field tensors you see the Lagrangian is purely a function of the derivatives of the uh, potentials as it were. Now you can see that uh, because uh, so the Euler Lagrange equations therefore can actually be even written as in the four vector notation like this. So think of uh, the way we would have written it in the context of uh, point particles. We would have written it as d by dt of dl by dq dot equals uh, dl by dq. So basically uh, this, this is uh, taking on the role of uh, del nu so it becomes generalized to include spatial coordinates as well and then this is uh, del nu. So you can uh, prove that this is this because you see in special relativity uh, space and time indices are on an equal footing. So you cannot really make a distinction like that. So you should be able to accommodate uh, spatial as well as time indices. So when you do that you get this but then keep in mind that uh, this f mu nu uh, does not depend upon the vector potentials themselves, it depends on the derivatives, the derivative with respect to space time coordinates. So because of that uh, the for the electromagnetic field in empty space uh, this the right hand side is always 0. Okay. So now the left hand side you can convince yourself is basically this one. So in other words del L by del you know if you differentiate with respect to one of them, so you will you will just get the other one and then because of anti-symmetry uh, this is this is the result. So, so in other words the four divergence of uh, any component of the vector potential is 0. So bottom line is that uh, this is uh, this is fine but except that uh, I would have preferred a more general situation where uh, the right hand side is not 0 that means I want to uh, take into account a situation where the uh, Lagrangian density is a function of the vector potential not only its derivatives. So for that we have to introduce uh, a vector potential dependent Lagrangian density. So when you do that you get uh, this relation and uh, so you will see that in addition to your usual uh, terms like this you also get uh, these terms. Okay. So this is called Prokas Lagrangian. Okay. So this is just to point out that uh, more general situations are possible. Now I am going to show to you that the most general type of Lagrangian such as this uh, which includes uh, you know dependence on the vector potentials themselves not just the derivatives can actually uh, even the more general ones like this lead to conservation laws. So the question is how do you uh, show that? 
So to show that you just uh, uh, what you do is basically you, you prove that this itself can be written as some four divergence. So as a result when you uh, take this, so if you can write this as a del nu of something then I can take this to the other side and then this becomes del nu and del L by del nu a rho minus dot 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 equals 0. So, this becomes your conserved quantity. So, that is what I am going to do now. So, let us uh, first evaluate the, uh, the gradient or basically the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to one of the space time coordinates. So, in that case uh, it uh, by chain rule you can show that this is equal to this. Uh, so, it becomes uh, so you see the Lagrangian density is a function of uh, the vector potential and its first derivative. So, the uh, you know in the Lagrangian formalism uh, the uh, Lagrangian density is a function of the vector potential and its first derivative. So, because of that you keep in mind that uh, in the Lagrangian formalism the coordinate and its uh, uh, you know time derivative are considered independent q and q dot are independent variables. So, but then you see q dot. Uh, so, keep in mind that I told you that in special relativity uh, dot uh, means the time derivative. So, that time derivative has to be generalized to include the special components as well because uh, in special relativity space and time gets uh, mixed up by Lorentz transformation. So, there is no precise notion of time or space, it is just space time put together has a precise notion. So, as a result uh, the uh, spatial derivative of the Lagrangian density can be written uh, using chain rule as follows. And uh, you see uh, uh, if you use Lagrange's equation you can rewrite this term uh, in this way. So, this is the Euler Lagrange equations. So, now when you do that you see uh, miraculously the right hand side of this uh, just becomes the uh, derivative or the, the gradient the 4 gradient of, uh, of another quantity. Okay. So, now uh, bottom line is that uh, this means that I can uh, rewrite. So, I, ca I can uh, basically rewrite this equation. Okay, so, uh, so, I can also rewrite this equation in this way. Okay. So, uh, so, if you expand this out you get this re result. So, you can try this out. So, if I expand this out I, I get this result because that is what this is. right? So, so, basically this I can rewrite as uh, del mu. So, del mu I can rewrite as uh, del nu uh, delta mu nu. Okay. So, that is what I have done here. So, this, this term comes from here. So, when I uh, do that and I put everything to one side I, I get this equals 0. So, what this means is basically it is saying that there is a conserved quantity called T tilde which is now a two component object and it is 4 divergence vanishes. So, the thing about the not so nice thing about this is uh, that uh, it is not symmetrical. So, we want it to be symmetrical because uh, you know the anti-symmetrical portions do not convey much meaning they are just a burden. So, you uh, will probably show that in some of the exercises that why the anti-symmetric part does not convey much meaning. So, we want a symmetric version of this. So, what we do this uh, is that we add a term like this. So, the rest of this is just making comparison with uh, the traditional electromagnetic fields in the uh, Maxwell kind of language rather than the 4 vector language. So, now what we do is that you see this T tilde is not symmetric. However, this S tilde can be added uh, to this which makes it symmetric. So, what we are going to do is that we are going to define a new object called T mu nu which is basically this T tilde which we derived by simply uh, combining Euler Lagrange equation with uh, you know chain rule. So, you see that is what we got T tilde and we showed that see we showed that it is conserved, but then uh, we can also add uh, the S tilde. S tilde is basically a new uh, two component object which when added to this T tilde uh, still has to maintain conservation laws. So, that means we have to make sure that uh, T, T mu nu is still uh, conserved in the sense that its 4, 4 divergence is 0. 
So in other words, because T tilde already is conserved, we have to make sure that S tilde is also conserved. But then on top of that, we have to choose a S tilde such that T tilde plus S tilde is symmetric. So you see, uh, this choice ensures that it is symmetric. So if you add this to this, uh, if you add these two, you get a T mu nu, which is clearly symmetric. Okay. So but then we have to show that S tilde is conserved. So to show that S tilde is conserved, you just take the derivative of S tilde with respect to uh, say del mu and you will see that it is conserved. So because, uh, because th these are mu, uh, f mu nu is uh, anti-symmetric under interchange of mu and uh, rho, uh, f, f mu rho is interchange, uh, anti-symmetric under interchange of mu and rho, but then this is just the product of uh, del rho and del mu which is clearly symmetric. So when you uh, mix a uh, anti-symmetric with symmetric term, you get 0. Okay, so uh, similarly this is 0 because uh, this is conserved, f mu nu is conserved. Okay. So as a result, uh, uh, s tilde is clearly conserved. So we can construct a t mu nu uh, which is conserved, uh, which has this property. Okay. So, so in other words, it is firstly symmetric and secondly, it is also conserved. So now we can go ahead and ask ourselves uh, what is the actual meaning. So we have constructed a symmetric object. So it is completely unrelated to f mu nu clearly because f mu nu is anti-symmetric, fully anti-symmetric whereas t mu nu is symmetric. So that is the big difference. The similarity is that both are conserved, t mu nu is conserved, f mu nu is conserved. This is the four divergence of both are 0. But then these two are not related at all because one is uh, anti-symmetric, the other is symmetric. So the question is, we, we know what is the physical meaning of f mu nu. Uh, I just displayed that earlier, it is a 4 by 4 matrix with diagonal element 0. The other uh, components of the matrix are basically the components of the electric and magnetic fields. So now the question is, in, sim in a similar way, we want to understand what are the components of uh, T mu nu. So for that, let us work out specifically uh, T00. Okay, so we can start by say T0 nu and then we work out T00, T01, T02 and that will that will be useful. So you see when I try to work out T0 nu, it is going to come out uh, like this and specifically T00 is going to be like this whereas T03 for example is going to be like this. But then what is F0i? So I, you see the Latin indices correspond to the spatial coordinates, the Greek indices could be either spatial uh, or time coordinates. So it includes time. If I write Latin indices like ij, uh, it implies that it is only the spatial coordinates excluding time. So uh, if that is the case, then F0i is clearly minus ei and the uh, covariant version of that is plus ei. So and also the this is by definition the Lagrangian density, so it is basically minus 1 by 8 pi, uh, yeah, so it is with a minus sign, so e squared minus b squared. Now if you combine these two, so t00 is this and you subtract this out, you see you will get uh, this result and this is the energy density of the electromagnetic field, okay. So that is the physical meaning of t00. So similarly, you can work out what is the physical meaning of T01, T02, T03, but specifically if you look at T03, it comes out as the Z component of E cross B. So that is basically the Z component of the pointing flux, so the pointing vector. So that you know from electromagnetic theory corresponds to the uh, momentum carried by the electromagnetic field, so the momentum density as it were. So this is the energy density, this is the momentum carried by the electromagnetic field. So uh, bottom line is that uh, you have uh, these two ideas. Okay. So now you can show that uh, because uh, you see uh, if you look at some region of space, if energy in that region of space is increasing, it is because momentum is flowing into uh, to that region or if the energy is decreasing, it is because momentum is flowing out of that region. So that is the energy conservation. So that uh, the four divergence of the energy momentum tensor equals 0 implies that actually implies that conservation law. So if you explicitly work this out, what this means is basically this, this result. This is a du by dt plus a divergence of s equals 0. 
okay. So now this of course could also have been derived directly from Maxwell's equations you, you know using just the vectorial notation which I am not going to go through. So uh, bottom line is that this is for T0 uh, nu, uh, so therefore for T0 nu there is a conservation law of this sort. But then you could also do it for T, uh, T i nu that or T nu i basically is that you do not have to look at the 0th component you can look at the other ones. Now if you look at the other ones also you get a similar conservation law okay. So now you see what was earlier uh, u in the du by dt now becomes the pointing vector in there. So that means not only is energy conserved in a region. So, the momentum uh, is also conserved, the total momentum in a certain region is also conserved. If uh, the momentum uh, S is a kind of energy flux, so because fr from here you can see that S represents a kind of energy flux. So, now if the energy flux is changing, it is due to some other kind of flux which is the flux of the energy flux, so which is that meaning of the remaining components of the energy momentum tensor. Okay, so that is less, uh, less intuitive and harder to visualize intuitively, but nevertheless you can still write down a matrix which is symmetric and it is 4 by 4 and you can uh, easily identify if not all many of the components. Uh, so you see the first column corresponds to the energy density uh, at the top left and then you have the momentum density in the remaining uh, rows. Then similarly. Uh, the diagonal components at, uh, from T11, T2 they correspond to radiation pressure, okay. So the remaining components are uh, basically identifiable as shear stress and energy and momentum flux. So bottom line is that uh, put together all these uh, components uh, are lead to their appropriate conservation loss and basically put together are responsible for the energy momentum content of the electromagnetic field, okay. Okay, so now uh, I am going to uh, show to you some examples uh, that uh, will convince you about uh, uh, this especially the 4 vector notation and tensor notation and so on and so forth. So I have given you some examples. So let us start with some simple example like uh, Noether's type of uh, example. So imagine that you have a vector, vector potential A and you replace it by a, uh, a transformed vector potential where you, you simply rotate that A by some amount, okay. But that phi is a scalar so it does not get rotated. Now uh, so if you uh, work in this gauge for example where phi is 0 and divergence of A is 0, then you can easily convince yourself that uh, this type of rotation leaves the uh, Maxwell equations invariant, uh, so the Lagrangian invariant. So that means there must be a conserved quantity and that conserved quantity is basically uh, going to be this, okay. So you can convince yourself that that is what it is, okay. So bo bottom line is that, uh, yeah, so this is a trivial example because uh, even though it looks like, so I have given you this example to convince yourself that there are many situations in which you get a conserved quantity which is actually trivial. So if you work this out, you will find that. Uh, this appears to be a conserved quantity and indeed it is simply because it is also identically 0, okay. So I give you this example just to point out that not all conserved quantities are interesting. For example, if you get a 0 as your answer, it is certainly conserved but it is not interesting, okay. So now let us go to some really interesting examples. So now I want to find the energy momentum tensor for example of a point particle. So uh, see if you have a point particle, uh, if it is at rest then its energy momentum tensor is clearly only energy, there is no momentum, nothing else, certainly none of the other components are going to be there. So it is going to just be energy density at the location of that uh, point. So that means the, uh, so if T dash is the reference frame in which the particle is at rest, clearly this is the energy momentum tensor. It is just uh, mc squared which is the energy uh, times the Dirac delta function at r dash which means assuming the particle is at the origin. So mc squared Dirac delta at r dash is basically the energy momentum tensor of the point particle. 
So now the question is I want to find out uh, what this energy momentum tensor is if you uh, transform to a moving frame. Okay, so if you transform to a moving frame you get this T mu nu. So now you know that uh, from your uh, the, the fact that these are tensors under Lorentz transformation uh, it is going to transform like this. Okay. So when it transforms like this it is it's clear that since T dash uh, is Kronecker delta of rho equals 0 and sigma equals 0 this is how it is going to transform. And we know uh, what are these lambdas which are basically the matrix involving uh, space time rotations which is basically the Lorentz transformation. So uh, and uh, we can clearly work this out as uh, gamma into V mu. So V mu is 1 V by C 0 0. So that is for boosts along the x direction which is customary. Okay, so, uh, so if you work this out you will see that uh, the T mu nu can be written like this. Okay. So, so where uh, it is it's going to involve the 4 velocity of uh, the particles in that uh, new frame, so the general frame and gamma is the dilatation factor and uh, this is R0 is the location of the particle at any given time. So, in general you can write this, so this is what it is going to be mc squared is the rest energy and this is the instantaneous velocity of the particle and uh, this 4 vector velocity is just uh, 1 for if that is time component and it is v by c if it is space component right. So this is your uh, energy momentum tensor of a point particle which is quite interesting because it is nice to know. So you see in, uh, in the case of a point particle also uh, the energy momentum tensor has all kinds of off diagonal components all those shear components and those which ones I displayed right. So the momentum flux and energy flux all kinds of off diagonal things are there in this. So uh, yeah so it is not something we could have guessed so that is why we had to derive it okay we could not have guessed this we could have guessed the T dash which is basically energy momentum tensor when the particle was at rest but not when it was in motion. Okay. So similarly we can ask a similar question what is the energy momentum tensor of a fluid. So if a perfect fluid, so imagine you have a perfect fluid uh, in, in the rest frame, you are in the rest frame of the perfect fluid in which case it is energy moment, so it has pressure, it exerts pressure, the fluid could exert pressure but it also certainly has a mass density, so you, you have the energy density and the pressure. So these are the um, components of the energy momentum tensor when the, so when the fluid is at rest. Now the question is similarly suppose you are moving relative to the fluid what is the energy momentum tensor. So as usual you do a Lorentz transformation and you can convince yourself that so the energy momentum tensor is actually uh, given by the as usual the 4 velocities and uh, the pressures and the densities. Okay. So this is your uh, Minkowski metric. So this is the energy momentum tensor of the perfect fluid. So in the next class I will explain to you uh, how to uh, solve Maxwell's equation. So this till now I have explained to you the content of the energy momentum tensor of the electromagnetic field so which is a nice concept. So in the next class I will tell you um, specifically how to find the solution of Maxwell's equation that is analogous to uh, you know calculating the trajectory of a point particle. So you have, after all uh, uh, Maxwell's equations are basically Euler Lagrange equation of some suitable Lagrangian. So sol solving Euler Lagrange equation is basically finding trajectory if that is was a point particle. So uh, this is basically also like finding a trajectory except now the, uh, the coordinates of a point particle but the they are actually fields themselves the coordinates are the fields themselves. So, uh, so the trajectory we are looking at is basically uh, how the fields themselves change with time. Okay. So that is what we are going to do in the next class, so I hope you will join me for the next class, thank you. Mm -hmm.